Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church on this beautiful day in central Kansas, isn't it? Makes you think about why we live in Kansas on days that are this, this cold. Oh well, uh, we're, I'm gl- grateful that you're all here. Uh, I encourage you to um, enjoy worship, for especially those joining us at home on, or uh, online or through KINA Radio who are uh, maybe wiser than us sitting at home uh, in pajamas uh, with a blanket and something really hot. Uh, so anyway, welcome to worship today. Let us worship God. As you are comfortably able, please stand and join in our call to worship. Where can we go from God's spirit? If we ascend to heaven, God is there. If we make our bed in Sheol, God is there. If we take the wings of morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there's God's hand shall this, and God's right hand will hold us fast. Let us worship God. Please remain standing as we join in our opening song, number 634, To God Be the Glory. Please be seated. Let us approach God with confidence, trusting in God's grace we, as we humbly confess our sins. Let us pray. Gracious God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our sins even before we confess. Your knowledge is wonderful, but also challenging. We'd much rather avoid painful truths and deny our role in wrongdoing. Help us face our failings so we can move forward in truth. Amen. Here are these words from Psalm 103. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.
morning. Glad to see all of you today. Do you guys know who this is? Who? I don't know what you said, Sid. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he was, he died before any of you were even born. So how do you know who he is? Civil rights from school. Um, what else do you know about Reverend King? He was a pastor. Anything else? He was born in Atlanta. <laughs> um, how about, um, do, you got, do you know that he was assassinated in 1968? Okay. Sometimes we recognize someone because we've seen them or pictures of them so often. Other times, it helps to get some other clues, such as what they're wearing, what they're doing, or who's with them. In our scripture today, Philip brings Nathaniel to meet Jesus. Nathaniel is surprised and amazed that Jesus recognizes him and seems to know so much about him. You recognize Martin Luther King Jr. because you've seen his picture before or you've heard about him. Jesus recognizes Nathaniel both from sight and both for the, by the kind of person he is. Jesus says that Nathaniel is an honest man. If Jesus were descri to describe us, what would he say? What are the things about us we would want Jesus to recognize? There are lots of things I know I want, would want Jesus to remember about me. If Jesus came to visit us, I'd want him to know that, like Nathaniel, I'm honest, how proud I am of being a teacher for so many years, and how much I love working with the children here at First Presbyterian Church. What about you? Can you name some things you would want people to know about you to help them know who you are? Any, anybody want to offer anything? They're, I think they're just going to think it today, maybe. Nathaniel became one of Jesus' disciples. He joined up with Jesus to help him spread the good news to others about God's plan for the world. Nathaniel wasn't perfect, but Jesus knew Nathaniel could help in the church. Jesus can take what is best in us and make us people who will help make the world a better place. We're not perfect, but God loves us and sees the best in us. And then because we love God, we try to let our best side show most of the time. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for knowing who we really are. Thank you for seeing the best in us. Help us to remember we aren't expected to be perfect and continually remind us that what is best about us is enough to help God make the world a better place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us pray. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. As we approach your word, may we be ready to receive the message you intend for us today. Amen. Please open your heart, mind, and spirit to listen for God's word to us from Psalm 139 verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in 
behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, and none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Thanks be to God. wasn't quite sure if we were going to have any kind of musical interlude between scripture, but seeing Ruth relaxing in the back, I'm going to guess that you don't expect me to do a solo. <laughs> the stories we tell about Jesus shape our understanding of who he is for us and our salvation, beginning with the soaring prologue of the fourth gospel that depicts the grand expectations we have for God's Son. Surely the Son of God would appear majestically in the midst of the great city of Jerusalem, site of political and economic power, religious authority, and God's own dwelling place in the temple. If not there, then at least somewhere that captures a sense of holy grandeur or kingly authority due to the one who becomes God in the flesh." Given such expectations, we might excuse Nathaniel in this morning's gospel for sounding like a disgruntled teenager, muttering derisive comments under his breath. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who would have expected God's son to come from a small town on the margins of a global empire? How do the stories we tell influence our understanding of what God is a capable of accomplishing both in our lives and through our congregation. Please open your heart, mind, and spirit to listen for God's word to us from the gospel according to John chapter 1 verses 43 to 51. The next day when Jesus decided to go to Galilee, he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, Jesus said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is God's word to us. In 2009, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie gave a TED talk titled, The Danger of a Single Story. It was about what happens when complex human beings and situations are reduced to a single narrative when Africans, for example, are treated solely as pitiable, poor, starving victims with flies on their faces. Adiche admitted that she, too, was guilty of reducing others to a single story. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family, Adiche said. 
My father was a professor, my mother an administrator. And so we had live-in domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. The year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy, she said. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about Fide was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes with Fide on his way home. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know? People like Fide's family have nothing. I felt enormous pity for Fide and his family. Then one Saturday, Adache recalled, her family went to Fide's village for a visit. And Fide's mother showed Adache's family a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia grass that his brother had made. I was startled, she said. It had not occurred to me that anybody in Fide's family could possibly make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was Adache's single story of Fide's family. Years later, Adache thought about this when she left Nigeria to attend university in America. She was 19 years old. Her American roommate was shocked that Adache did not live up to her single story of a foreigner. Adache's roommate asked where she had learned to speak English so well and was confused when Adache said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. And her, then her roommate asked if she could listen to what she called Adache's tribal music and was equally disappointed when Adache produced a tape of Mariah Carey. What struck me was this, Adache recalled. Her roommate had, left, had felt sorry for her Nigerian roommate even before they had met. Her American roommate's default position was, as an African, a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. Adache's roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In that single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to Americans in any way. No possibility of feelings more complex than pity. No possibility of connection as human equals. So what single stories do we tell about those who inhabit our life? What single stories do we tell about others to reduce them to something less than God has created them to be so that we can easily categorize them? Or what single story do we tell about our congregation which prevents us from living more fully into all that God hopes we will accomplish? Nathaniel had a single story about those who came from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel's reaction to Philip calling him to follow Jesus introduces a theme that is repeated throughout the Gospels. People's preconceptions about Jesus, which stood in the way of fully grasping God's grace, hope, and love revealed in Jesus Christ. But Jesus does not allow others' single stories about himself to get in the way of revealing the greater things Jesus promises. The Pharisees, later in John chapter 9, for example, told themselves a story about Jesus in which he was not as good as them. This led them to envision Jesus as being incapable of doing anything significant, much less being able to restore sight to a blind man. And even those who are closest to Jesus let their preconceived notions, the single stories they constructed about who Jesus was, to get in the way of a fresh encounter with the Word made flesh. Martha was so sure of her understanding of Jesus the healer that she was unprepared to witness Jesus the resurrection and life of God's Spirit when Jesus raised her brother Lazarus from death to life. The single stories we tell ourselves about Jesus can prevent us from fully living into God's grace, hope, and love each day we are given. 
If we only think of Jesus saving us from our sin, will we be open to being led by Christ together in faith and love all other days of our life? If we think of Jesus watching and waiting for us to fall short of the glory of God, will we ever be able to think, question, grow, and serve Christ's purposes as a congregation? Nathaniel knew the stories his people had told for millennia about who the Messiah would be and how the Messiah would be revealed. And none of those stories had anything to do with Nazareth, let alone someone who is known as a son of Joseph. Nathaniel knew that the Hebrew scriptures never mention Nazareth, much less associate such an insignificant hamlet with messianic expectations. Nazareth then lent no special status to its inhabitants, so when Philip told Nathanael that Jesus was the one whom Moses and the prophets had written, Nathanael concluded that Philip must have been mistaken. In Nathanael's view, Jesus could be nothing more than a simple Jew from an insignificant village in Galilee. But for those of us who know the full scope of the fourth gospel, we know the larger story of which Nathanael was unaware. While Jesus was indeed the son of Joseph from Nazareth, Jesus was also the word made flesh, who was with God from the beginning and who was God. So once Nathanael gets beyond his impertinent comment about people from Nazareth and enters into Jesus' presence, he begins to see Jesus more fully. As the Gospels unfold, both Nathanael and all of us who come and see Jesus in our life are given visions of greater things than we could ever imagine if we remained resting underneath our own fig tree. The call of Nathanael and a deeper relationship with Jesus suggests two claims. First, God can accomplish great things in unlikely places. As is often the case, the Gospels want us to see the irony of the disciples' question. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? As a way of inviting us into into all that God's Word will reveal to us. Our faith compels us to respond to Nathaniel's grumbling question with an affirmation of faith. Yes, indeed, good things do come out of Nazareth and anywhere else God chooses to dwell. This is true for locales and locals alike, as well as for churches large and small and those who have been established for a long time or are newer. God is continually at work in you and me and together as a congregation when we remain open to God's larger story we are invited into through Jesus Christ. A second claim of Nathaniel coming to see Jesus' true identity is that God is perfectly capable of honoring ordinary people. Scripture and our own experience bear witness to the fact that with God's help, anyone can nurture greatness. Throughout the Gospels, the disciples take what they learn from Jesus and spread the good news beyond their small circles of friends. Then in the years that follow, they spread the Gospel throughout the known world. Once the disciples move beyond their single stories of Nazareth and a limiting story about who Jesus is, They live into the far far greater things of which Jesus promised. So what about us? What single story do we tell ourselves about First Presbyterian Church? God and Jesus looks beyond the single stories we tell about ourselves and others, encouraging us to trust that God has many great things in store for both our individual walk and together as a congregation the story God is revealing through us. So let us leave room for God in Christ to accomplish far greater things than those we have seen so far. Let us be led into all that God has in store for you and me when we follow those who are ordained and installed today, who have been called as surely as Philip called Nathaniel, as together we make our way into God's greater promises. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and humanize. 
Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also, also restore broken dignity. Can anything good come out of First Presbyterian Church of Salina? It depends on the stories we tell about our congregation. Are we willing to believe that the best days are behind us, that God's work is done, and there's nothing left for us to do? Or are we willing to trust that when we come and see Jesus here in this place, that he is going to usher us into greater things than we have seen so far? Chibamanda Ngozi Adiche ended her TED Talk with this thought, one that reflects God's promise found when we come and see and follow Jesus. That is, when we reject the single story, when we realize that there is never a single story about any place or any one, we too regain a kind of paradise. Can anything come, anything good come out of First Presbyterian Church of Salina? When we come and see and follow Jesus, we know that the answer is a resounding yes. Good will flow through you and me and those who will lead us as elders and deacons as we seek to follow where Jesus leads in all we say and do, both individually and together as a community of faith. Following Jesus, we will see far greater things than God has revealed so far. Let us pray. As we enter this new day, O oh God, we give thanks for breath and life, for the people we will see today, for family, neighbors, and friends, and for those whose ways challenge us. Help us give thanks, especially for those who pull us into new understandings and who show us sides of ourselves that we have not known or wish to see. Urge us to follow you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you're able, I invite you to stand and join in affirming our faith using words from a brief statement of faith. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God we hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation in everlasting love the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Please remain standing as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Please be seated. Well, most of you, please be seated. So I'd like Randy Graham to come stand beside me. And then if you're being ordained or installed today, hopefully you know who you are. Do you need me to read names here? So Martha Ray, um, well, Mar Paige is not here, but and Betty uh, Timmel, but Brian Carlgren, Saul Kathy Hayes, uh, Britton Zuccarelli, and uh, I know Katie's out of town, but Ann Payne is here. I don't think I saw Bev Zazumbo, uh, Randy Hardy, Peter Johnston, and Craig Renfro. So if you'll come down and stay off to my left, off to Randy on my left, um, so you can be ordained and installed. Great. Oh, you're all mic'd up. Good. Let's see if it works. Yeah. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as God's own or Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church now ordains Paige Enriquez, Martha Ray, and Betty Timmel to the office of deacon, and Brian Carlgren, Kathy Hayes, and Britton Zuccarelli to the office of ruling elder and installs them. The session also installs to active service Katie England, Ann Payne, and Bev Zazumbo, who have previously been ordained as deacons, and Randy Hardy, Peter Johnston, and Craig Renfro, who have previously been ordained as ruling elders. As I've said before, as we turn to the constitutional questions, um, which many of you have heard before, listen carefully uh, for these uh, questions contain a lot of our theology. Uh, they're a, a little summary of Christian faith and practice as we understand it as uh, Presbyterians. You have the first question. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church, universal, and God's word to you? If so, please say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Christ scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do and I will. I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I will. I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say, I will. Katie, Paige, Ann, Martha, Betty, and Bev, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help 
to the friendless and those in need in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. Brian, Randy, Kathy, Peter, Craig, and Britton, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. All right, so we're ordaining and not just installing folks, so that means several up here have been set apart for leadership and have never served as an elder and deacon. So it is a special time for them as they're ordained and the others are installed. I invite anyone who's a, a ruling elder or deacon in the Presbyterian Church to come forward and we'll lay hands on them and pray for them as they enter into this uh, ministry. It's a great day to do this because of being so cold. <laughs> You're not that high up yet, Joe. <laughs> Let us pray. God of grace, pour your Holy Spirit on these people, that they may be faithful deacons and ruling elders in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve wherever there is need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of power, and to communicate your presence and might among those who are powerless in everything. Give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give to these people joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Amen. I invite you to extend the right hand of fellowship to those who have been ordained and installed and then find your seats. Congratulations, Kathy. Congratulations, Kathy. Congratulations, Congratulations, Kathy. Congratulations. Kathy. Congratulations. 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 Hopefully going the wrong way here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Congratulations. Oh, congratulations, Peter. Right. Congratulations. Peter. Congratulations. Thanks. Just to conclude that, Katie, Paige, Ann, Martha, Betty, Bev are now deacons, and Brian, Randy, Kathy, Peter, Craig, and Britton are now ruling elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life may bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. All right, got some announcements, no doubt, for you. Find them. Well, I know one of them is a great day for you to know that there, is, there are coffee and donuts in the back. If you're not already done so, that would have been a great way to warm your hands through worship other than standing in the pulpit, uh, is to get some coffee in the back and donuts to help you uh, stay nice and cozy. Uh, a new adult class has begun in the uh, conference room before and after worship, uh, looking at different matters of faith and life. Uh, today's topic is taking the Bible seriously. It goes right along with what Don Schroeder preached a couple of weeks ago about having a biblically literate new year. So if you want to think about how we take the Bible seriously as Presbyterians, you can join 
uh, me after worship in the conference room. The weeks to come, we'll be looking at the topics of thinking theologically, stories of creation, lives of Jesus, and the final one before Lent will be a passion for Christ, uh, who Paul is in the life of the church. If you've not done so already, please make sure you sign the friendship pads and pass them along the way, taking the top page and putting on, on the top of the friendship pad to help ushers with cleanup. I should also mention that next week is Boy Scout Sunday. I think you saw C.A. Ritter outside getting ready to sell chili in Idaho is pancakes. So um, how great is it? Pancakes are okay, but uh, chili this time of year will be great unless you know, it warms up by the time the chili feed happens. So, um, so please make sure you uh, purchase tickets and help welcome scouts next week here in worship. Let us pray. Eternal God, just as you called Samuel and the prophets of old, you call us to lives of love and justice, breaking down barriers that divide, building bridges of cooperation, peace, and beloved community. As we remember the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., we pray for the day when all God's children can be free. We pray for the day your children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We pray for the day when hate and violence and bigotry are overwhelmed by love and peace and acceptance. Let justice roll down like waters, holy God, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. For too long, God of justice, oppressed peoples have heard the word wait, a word that King said almost always means never. God, help us push toward progress on issues of justice and work diligently toward the vision of your kingdom community. Holy God, hear the prayers of your people. As global wars rage and gun violence desecrates, protect the innocent and help us prioritize efforts of peace. In the face of political polarization, Help us listen more, seek understanding, and approach those with whom we disagree with curiosity, humility, and openness. Help us listen for the story beneath other people's stories. In the face of fear and anxiety, pressures and provocation, help us find in you a refuge and strength, a steadfast support in times of trial. Remind us, holy God, we are not alone. Bless those who are suffering, ill, and grieving. Bless those who feel weak and worn down by our world. United as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you, Savior God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, we have recognized and installed members of this congregation to serve as ruling elders and deacons for their elected terms of office. The Presbyterian Church Book of Order reminds us that the government of our church is representative. The right of God's people to elect ruling elders and deacons is an inalienable, and no person can be placed in one of these roles except by election of that congregation. The ministry of deacons is one of compassion, witness, and service. Ruling elders, together with ministers of the word and sacrament, exercise leadership, government, spiritual discernment, and disciple have responsibilities for the life of the church. As we celebrate and recognize our members who are taking their turns in these leadership roles, we remember that much of the work is done through committees and many volunteers who are involved. As our new year begins, please prayerfully consider your role and consider stepping forward 
to take an active part in some way to help carry forward the ministry and mission of this congregation. If you care about our facility, join the Building and Grounds Committee. If you have an idea about faith formation or worship, join one of those committees. If you have strengths in areas of finance or personnel, join one of those committees. If you like to make calls of encouragement, cook, or take part in crafts, a number of opportunities abound. When we all do our part, great things can be done. We invite you now to join together as partners in ministry, making a generous gift as we continue our ministry to change lives in Salina and beyond. We offer numerous ways for you to express your gratitude through giving and join in this transformational partnership. I invite you into the wonderful, life-changing act of faith. The ushers will now receive our morning offering. Thank you. Because of you, lives are changed. pray. Holy God, these offerings are only a portion of all that you have given us. We gratefully present these gifts and entrust them to your work in this world. May our gifts share the good news of the gospel to those who are in need. May these gifts help unburden those with the heaviest of loads. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing number 722, Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
As you go from this place, I invite you to find your place in God's larger story of grace, hope, and love revealed to us in God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.